D and the AA had to make special provisions. Uh, Mr Ryan, has uh, this new motorway given you any new problems? No, we don't think so. We, we regard this new motorway as, as, as uh, yet another important main road. Um, we really don't know what's going to happen. The first night I was on the motorway, I had eight cars, all with the same, all the same make and all the same trouble. And everyone who got his big ends gone. Big ends didn't go on that car. It's a car that lasted forever. And uh, this is the old woman Minx. I mean, you, you get four or five, six a day. I mean, all the garages were changing engines as fast as they could go. I think you began to definitely go. There are telephones along the motorway, but in any case, help shouldn't be long in coming. Here's an AA mobile radio control centre. A patrol van is soon on the way to the breakdown. Overheating. About 25% of all the cars, which were over five years old, had got black radiators. Half the cars hadn't got temperature gauges, and they just boil up. All of a sudden, they'd be going along and knock, 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 knock. <laughs> uh, either the big end's gone or the piston's gone. The pistons used to melt. You always knew what it was before you got there, because as you were driving up the motorway, you'd suddenly see a big patch of oil for, for about 100 yards on the, on the road. And uh, it, it just sort of, as, as he pulled in, so the oil would still be dripping, you know, another one gone. G I'll go and give him the good news. We did 13 and a half thousand jobs, breakdowns, in the first year the motorway was opened. And 13,000 is a lot of breakdowns. Aerial patrols will provide an even speedier method of spotting the motorist in trouble. General information about road conditions and any hold-ups can be radioed to AA headquarters in London. 30 traffic advisors man this operations room at Fainham House. For motorists from the north, for example, this map shows how they may take advantage of the motorway to get to any point in the southeast. As for the motorway itself, there's been a spot of bother with the so-called hard shoulder at the side of the road. The hard shoulder seems to be soft, in places at any rate. Stop on it and you may get bogged down. I went on there. Of course, we had oily polished boots. And when I got home, you couldn't see my boots. So my trousers were sort of reddish-brown colour. And uh, of course, I'd, I'd just stepped out the car, out the Land Rover, you see, straight into the hard shoulder. And down I went. <laughs> Many breakdowns were reported on the first day, but there are excellent facilities to deal with these. And with accidents. And on the subject of accidents, Mr. Marples had a word of warning to all high-speed motorists. For on this magnificent road, the speed which can easily be reached is so great that senses may be numbed and judgment warped. We were having a lot of accidents. We had no crash barriers at first. And so what we did have were these head-on collisions, even if they were doing 70 miles an hour, head-on at 140 miles an hour. Now, nobody realised that this was a dangerous thing to put a piece of grass with a bit of gravel. It was very good for us, police officers, because if we saw a car that we wanted to stop going the other way, we could swing round as we did do on the grass verge. We would spiral round and fly the other way without thinking about it. If you overshoot the turning point, don't try to do this. Reversing and turning on the motorway is an offence which could cost you 20 pounds in a magistrate's court. If you miss your turning, you must continue along the motorway to the next exit. Officially, you drove right, right round to the next junction and went back up again. If it was quiet, you went across Centre Reservation. And funny enough, the police did the same thing, ambulance did the same thing, the AA and the RAC, even the garages did it. Visitor to Blackbush Airport was Transport Minister Ernest Marples, seeking, as always, more safety on the roads. He was there to see a car driven at 60 miles an hour against a new type fence, flexible but with a 22-ton braking strain, specially designed for motorways. A well-designed barrier that's meant to bring you, bring your speed down and redirect you safely onto your own carriageway. Better to hit that than to hit someone coming the opposite way at 70 miles an hour. The driver was unhurt and damage to the car was superficial. 
1962, Ernest Marples announced the government's plan to complete a thousand miles of motorway. A year later, he commissioned a report into the profitability of British railways, written by Dr. Richard Beeching. Dr. Beeching, do you personally believe that the government has no real alternative but to accept your plan? I think that these proposals are in the long-term interests of railwaymen. I think they'll go along with us. Beeching was, was, I suppose, the first executive businessman to put in charge of the railways. He was an ICI executive. ...towards making the railways do those things that they can do best. But he came in with this brief to slash them up, to axe them. There's a famous phrase, the Beeching Axe. Today's report will shape the future of the system. More than 2,000 stations will be closed. The most dramatic effects are in Scotland. Remote areas of the Highlands will lose their services. Wales takes a body blow as well. Holiday resorts in the West Country share the fate of many market towns. No station, no passenger trains. In the North East, little more than the main North-South links will remain. These carriages, which have carried generations of holidaymakers and people going to the office, have come to the end of the line. Anything that can be used again economically is salvaged, but there is nothing much that can be done with old woodwork except this. It meant the um, abandonment of enormous assets, which were the creation of the previous century. And now we very much wish we hadn't done it. So Beeching was a believer that the railways were essentially old-fashioned. He was going to modernize them, but it also meant, in a way, undermining them and giving traffic to the motorways. Motorways may have been the fastest way to travel, but they were still at the mercy of the British weather. And then we just got here now. Four How far there. have you come? About five, five miles. miles. That's taken you over three hours? Yes. yes. Yeah, close on it. Close How does this it. compare with other fogs that you've driven oh, in? Oh, this is the worst. This is, is it about this the, the worst, worst yes. I've Definitely, definitely the worst. Yeah. Fog was much more common in the mid-1960s uh, than, than nowadays because of industrial air pollution and coal fires in houses and so on. Uh, in particular, you're afraid to go too slowly in case you get hit from behind. Uh, and then, of course, you find you hit something in front. And so you've got these multi-vehicle pilots, which were a new phenomenon. There's cars coming through the fog. 50, 60 miles an hour. I mean, you, they couldn't see where, you couldn't see across three lines, so you could just imagine what it, uh, they were just hurtling and, and they go, you hear it go, meow, bump, meow, bump. And this would happen on a regular basis, 40 or 50 cars all smashed into one another. Somebody devised a wonderful scheme where we had two spotlights, orange spotlights, on a big black pole connected, because there was no electricity, connected to a car battery in a box beneath it. These were every mile, so that when the fog arrived, the police car on that section could switch a switch and switch these two flashing lights on. And then, people without a car battery would think, there's a lot of car batteries on the motorway. So we would then come to these signs in the emergency, perhaps they hadn't been on for three weeks, batteries all gone. Again, electronics come to man's aid and save time and effort. Motorway police have been armed with ray guns. They're harmless except for fog warning lights. We were a bit like cowboys then. We couldn't wait for the headquarters to say, can you switch all the fog signs on? Ho, oh, oh, get my gun out, and away we go. A motorway cop shows how good a marksman he is on the move with the new Space Age lamplighter. Ready, aim, fire. Good shot. But we were even better than that. We got really good at it, because if you could get this one on and swing round, you could get the one on on the other carriageway in one fell swoop, and it was quite, I got them all on this time. And policemen were going, yes, I got the lot. And if somebody missed one, oh, and you had to reverse all the way back, you know, oh, you get him, swap over and I'll put the lights on. Good shot. Along with radar guns, the motorway police had faster cars than their colleagues on the A roads. It's what you might call light work. We had the Mark II Jaguar when I first went on the motorway. Then we altered 
to the Jaguar XJ6, that was an improvement. When they were being made, the factory knew which ones were ours. And we only knew that they knew which were our cars when we came to cut the headlining in the car to put the police signs on the top. And then we would find written in the top, all coppers are bastards. With no speed limit and no legal requirement to wear seat belts, motorways became the scene of some of the most horrendous accidents. In 1966, Barbara Castle, the new Labour Secretary for Transport and first female cabinet minister, introduced a preliminary speed limit of 70 miles per hour. But the British motorist has got fed up with being pushed around by successive governments. But there were still those that resisted it. Limits and parking restrictions. You're here to protest, are you? Yes, we are. Why? Well, because I think it's stupid. I drive about 24,000 miles and a lot on motorways. And it's quite ridiculous if you're expected to sort of dawdle along at 70 miles an hour. How fast have you been in your car? Um, I've had it up to about 115. If you examine the accidents, you find that speed is a terribly important, terribly is the word, important element in the causation of road accidents. And here were fast roads built to be, for the purpose, safer, but speed can be too great for them. So don't have it. For safety's sake, Barbara Castle, what does she think of? People. Safety. Yes, right. The main thing that I remember about Barbara Castle was the opening of the next length of the London Yorkshire Motorway when she was the Minister of Transport. And this was at the time when she was forefronting the seatbelt campaign. And I suppose at some expense we had hired a Rolls Royce for her to drive in drive along the motorway as, uh, when it was opened. And she wouldn't get in it because it hadn't got seat belts in the back. So she wouldn't travel in this <laughs> expensively hired Rolls Royce. By 1968, seat belts, breathalysers and the 70 mile per hour speed limit had become law. The thousand mile motorway plan continued with one of the most ambitious and adventurous schemes yet to build the highest motorway in Britain. While the M1 took just 19 months to complete, the seven mile Pennine section of the M62 would take nearly seven years. The M62 is the great sort of trans-Pennine motorway and it is a truly magnificent achievement. Now that's very rare in Britain to have a motorway which is quite mountainous in British terms. And a motorway, of course, where you get tremendously foul weather. Originally a packhorse route, the A62 was the only road across the Pennines connecting Yorkshire and Lancashire. By the early 1960s, it was gridlocked with lorries and trade was being severely affected. In the winter months, vehicles could be trapped under 12-foot snowdrifts and sections of the route closed for up to four months at a time. The purpose of the design of the M62, or the basic remit was to ensure that it was going to be kept open all the time and not be close to snow. In other words, they wanted a motorway that was going to be kept open for seven days a week, 52 weeks of the year, and never close to traffic. The Pennine section was to be by far the biggest challenge. Climbing to a height of 1,200 feet, it would mean blasting through rock to create a dam. The engineers would then have to build the largest single-span bridge in Europe, while the planned route for the motorway lay across a peat bog. It's not possible to build a motorway over a peat bog because it'll not support anything. And bearing in mind it's such a high moisture content, you're better to go through it in a boat, actually. And the contractor actually lost a series of machines in the peat. OK, they were recovered eventually, but it presented an enormous problem. The only way to start building on the bog was to remove the peat. How to get the peat out? The only answer was to work with a large face shovel using the underlying... All 11 and three-quarter million cubic yards of it. The only machine that can actually traverse it 
was the Muskeg, the Muskeg tractor. This Muskeg tracked vehicle was light enough to cope with the soft, spongy ground and steep-sided clumps. And the man put in charge of this challenging project was 28-year-old Geoffrey Hunter. He made regular appearances in many of the films that were made about the motorway. This job is different. The whole geography is against us. The weather conditions are against us. They're extremely adverse. The Pennine weather was so harsh that few people lived there. Although only half a dozen people lived on the planned motorway route, it was to have a huge impact on their lives. Any project as big as this is bound to upset the life. One house was to become almost as famous as the motorway itself. Here, the carriageways were planned to divide. It's a shame, really, because there used to be a myth around for many years after the motorway being constructed that the farmer living in the house wouldn't move and refused to move, and therefore we divided the carriageways and put it round it. And that, in essence, sadly, is not true. In fact, the motorway was built around the farmhouse because the land on which it was standing was unstable and had to be shored up. It was cheaper to build two roads around it. The Wilde family were living there at the time. You <laughs> think of being diggers and trucks and people everywhere, do you? <laughs> Running past your window. They come on with the ukes, are they? The big wagons full of stone, and every so often there'd be a bang, and the quarry would go boom. <laughs> and frack you to death. Yeah, you never knew when they were going to be blasting. It must have been very difficult for the occupant, Mrs. Wilde, at the time. The only time I ever met her was because of complaints of dust, and I could understand that problem. The hall roads, pounded by heavy vehicles, soon dissolved into fine dust that choked men and machines and reduced visibility to nil. You could not hang your washing out because you worked from 8 in the morning until 8 in the evening, seven days a week. It caused collisions and delays and complaints from farmers some distance away that their crops were being smothered. It was pointless cleaning the house because it was just absolutely covered in dust. So I used to have to start cleaning the house at 8 o'clock at night when they stopped. We actually watered the formation to keep the dust down and to make certain that she and her family and everybody else could live there. The M62 was national news. Work went on seven days a week and the site was inundated with visitors. Tourists came by the coachload on Sunday afternoons to watch as seven million cubic yards of rock was excavated to create the Scamondon Dam. Running on top of it, a 200-foot-high motorway embankment was being constructed. The original plan for the motorway cut across the ancient route of the Pennine Way and would have meant diverting walkers. But ramblers, including the Transport Secretary, Mr Marples, had objected. So a special footbridge was built across the motorway, allowing the walkers to continue their journey. Across Steenhill Cutting, the largest single-span bridge in Europe was being constructed. Covered in 70 miles of scaffolding to protect it from wind speeds of up to 110 miles per hour, in the Pennine winter, it was able to withhold the weight of 1,100 tonnes of ice. Nobody appreciates just how big and how massive that structure is because it's dwarfed by the vastness of the landscape around it. It looks just a small bridge spanning over a motorway in the middle of a cutting. The cutting is sufficiently wide enough to absorb the whole of the new Wembley Stadium. Put it in the middle of it, you wouldn't see it because everything around it is lost in the horizon behind it. The climate was probably the most atrocious thing that we had to cope with. The engineering problems and considerations one can make decisions on, one can't control the climate. Now, I'm an old man now, and it's 40-odd years since I took part in this contract, but the climatic conditions were the thing, probably, that are so deeply imprinted on my mind that man and machine had to endure, fighting the climate constantly. This is also the only place in the world where it'll actually rain if you can find it trouser legs. 
It's very simple, actually, to explain this. The wind comes down these valleys very quickly indeed. Rain driven in its path, it actually blows it uphill. It's terribly frightening when it actually occurs to you. And it wasn't only driving rain and wind at the time. It was dramatic drops in temperature. It was working in constant cloud. And when it comes down, it's accompanied by a dramatic... It was a matter of survival. Exposure can set in. Men then, and machinery, begin to suffer. Oh, the conditions were terrible. The conditions were really bad, even for me, than the machine. I, when you went in there in the morning, you were cold. Next thing you'd look around, and geez, you couldn't see nothing. And the only thing you could do then is stop. And somebody would come and rescue you, you know, and it was very frightening sort of work. I just went to rain there, it rained. Oh, it was like something like monsoons, like, you know. It's come down, it start off like that, and the next thing, you'd be, you'd be shivering in the cab. You'd be saying, well, geez, I hope it doesn't come in here. <laughs> oh, yes. There were days on end when you couldn't work, and you had to either sit in the cabs or in the rest huts, waiting for the rain to ease off, they just had to sit there, and literally they ate mud, walked in mud, sat in mud, and were aware of mud, and there was mud in the sandwiches. Whenever possible, because of these conditions, work was extended sometimes to 24 hours a day. If we could work around the clock under floodlights, we did, and had to. Day, dusk. Sometimes clean through the night and round to another day. Keep going while the weather's with you. Cause it... You didn't have very good lighting. You just had a few lights on the jib of the crane, and sometimes and you wouldn't be able to see a lot, but you'd manage it. And uh, that might be going on at 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. And uh, it took a lot of skill on the driver's part, and it took a lot of skill on the banksman's part. There was a banksman on top directing you in, like, you know. Our jobs was concentration more than anything else. You know, when you were driving the crane, you, you had to concentrate or you could kill somebody. Touch wood, I never had a, I never had an accident. They had to give up work, I don't know, the second winter, I think, because of the weather conditions. Everything was bogged down, they couldn't move a thing. And I think they finished for three months. And then they came back with a vengeance. <laughs> it, oh, it was like bedlam. <laughs> but there again, you got used to it again. On October the 14th, 1971, in glorious weather, the project was honored by a visit from Her Majesty the Queen. With the opening of the Scammerdon Dam, the Pennine section of the M62 was finally complete. The overall length of this Pennine contract was just short of seven miles, and it took seven million pounds to build, which is literally a million pounds a mile. And now today, you can traverse it in seven minutes. And it's ironic to think that people that go across it now never sort of really can think or envisage what actually happened in those days some 45 years ago. Man's great ingenuity and willingness to accept such enormous challenges has brought to a successful end this Pennine project. A mile of motorway a week had been opened between 1960 and 1970. The next challenge was to start joining some of them up. Fifteen years in the planning and construction, Gravelly Hill Interchange or Spaghetti Junction, as it's better known, would be different to anything that had gone before it in the history of British motorway construction. Across five different levels raised on 600 reinforced concrete columns, this was to be the link between the M1, the M5 and the M6. Crammed onto a 30-acre site, it needed to be choreographed around both the existing industry and the local community. And of course, when it started, 
Oh, the mess was dreadful. It may have been Absolutely you know I mean? you can awful. Oh, the dirt. The kids came in and with the dirt and, you know, you pushed your pram through it and if it was a wet day, you still had to push it back into the hall because you couldn't leave it outside and it was it was just just a nightmare. Dirt, the dirt was just a nightmare. Well, the first time I think we heard was the next door neighbour and he said to us, do you know there's a motorway coming here? So we just thought, well, we'll wait and see what happens, you know. So, then the motorway was too late. <laughs> yeah. We were trapped. 175,000 cubic yards. The engineers had to elevate 13 and a half miles of motorway to accommodate two railway lines, three canals, and two rivers. Building a viaduct of this length needed careful planning and design. There was a great canal system in Birmingham. And we had to provide a column arrangement so that you could still tow a barge with a horse. I nearly went mad when they said to But anyway, we had to do that so we, to rearrange the columns so that they could get their horse round there. It was an interesting job, certainly. You can see why they call it Spaghetti Junction, though the engineers point out that unlike a plate of spaghetti, it stands up and it's highly planned. Spaghetti Junction is anything but a formless lump. It required a great deal of engineering, planning and design before its final shape was, uh, was achieved. But it, yes, it, it is, a, I think, a remarkable achievement. I think it was a clever thing. Yeah. I think it's been quite a clever thing for the people that it hasn't affected. But uh, it's not a pleasant thing to live but I think the engineers that built it should come and live here for at least a month <laughs> <laughs> with all the windows propped open. <laughs> Just 14 years after the Preston Bypass was opened, Spaghetti Junction was completed. It was opened in November 1972 by Peter Walker, the Environment Secretary for Edward Heath's Tory government. This is perhaps the most exciting day in the history of the road system in this country. The job fell to him because the departments responsible for transport, housing and local government had been combined, a sign of the changing attitudes to motorways and their impact on the environment. And it is, I may say so, a triumph for motorway engineering. Perhaps more important, an illustration of how motorways can improve environments. I declare this runway open. By 1972, a thousand miles of motorway had been built in Britain, and another thousand was expected. From the first eight miles of the Preston Bypass to the engineering feats of Spaghetti Junction, Britain's love affair with the motorway had truly begun. Next time, we look at how the motorway changed our lives and where it's taken us. Sadly, John Cox died during the making of this film.